Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Grace Gotchling. The decision in Ramos v. Louisiana was handed down on April 20, 2020. The Supreme Court held that the Sixth Amendment guarantees criminal defendants the right to a unanimous jury verdict in both federal and state courts. In reaching its decision, the court fractured over the precedential weight it should accord its prior Sixth Amendment decisions, raising significant doctrinal questions about the role of stare decisis in constitutional cases. And now, to discuss the case, we have John Richter, partner at King & Spaulding LLP. So, have have a chance today to talk about uh, the Ramos versus Louisiana decision handed down by the Supreme Court yesterday. As many of you have probably read, the Supreme Court held that the Sixth Amendment guarantees criminal defendants the right to a unanimous jury verdict in both federal and state courts now. The court's six to three decision regarding the Sixth Amendment and juror juror unanimity uh, and the fact that the Sixth Amendment is incorporated fully against uh, the states was probably the least uh, controversial and uh, least debated aspect of the opinion. The court uh, fractured very badly over the presidential weight that should be accorded uh, in its prior Sixth Amendment decision in Apodoca versus uh, Oregon from 1972. Uh, And in reading the opinion, you can see there are significant doctrinal differences between the justices regarding Uh, the approach in this particular case and the role of stare decisis in constitutional cases and obviously here in a criminal constitutional case. Given the fractured nature of the opinions and the complicated nature of the Apodoca uh, uh, case that, that was abrogated, it remains to be seen exactly when the consequences uh, or what the consequences will be for stare decisis uh, and whether the re- rhetoric amongst the justices, uh, most of which, of course, uh, really is dicta here, uh, how that plays out in subsequent decisions and which decisions uh, they harness it for. Uh, it's clear, however, that Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch who wrote for the majority, certainly uh, pushed a strongly a school of thought uh, suggesting that the power of stare decisis should be weakest in areas where constitutionally protected interests are at stake and where uh, the prior decision is hard to justify uh, in order to prevent uh, wrongly decided cases or incorrectly decided cases from permanently limiting or foreclosing rights guaranteed by the Constitution. I'll give a little bit of background about the uh, Ramos case. Even Jalisto Ramos was charged in 2014 with sexual assault and second degree murder. And in his trial, only it was a 10-2 verdict, voting to convict, and he was sentenced to life without parole. Obviously, in most states, in 48 states, and frankly, in Louisiana today, uh, if the crime had been committed in 2020, a 10-2 verdict would be a mistrial. And Louisiana uh, had passed a constitutional amendment requiring unanimous jury verdicts for crimes committed after December 31, 2018. Uh, And so the court was considering a rule that uh, was going to rapidly fall into uh, the past. Uh, To some degree, that may play, have played a bit into the reasoning of some on the court as this rule certainly to uh, a majority of the members of the court did not seem like it was too big to fail. 
Ramos obviously challenged his conviction, arguing that the Sixth Amendment guarantees defendants the right to a unanimous jury verdict. Uh, and uh, the state appeals court uh, rejected that argument. The Louisiana Supreme Court denied cert in 2018, and the U.S. Supreme Court granted cert in 2019. Oral argument was held in October of 2019, and the court released its opinion yesterday. Uh, the, during the litigation that, that led up to the decision, uh, there were certainly, uh, in addition to the parties, numerous amici curiae briefs that were filed. The majority uh, overwhelmingly were filed on behalf of Ramos and argued for incorporation of the unanimous jury trial right against the states. Uh, however, there were a group of states that included Utah, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, West Virginia, and Puerto Rico, which filed briefs in support of Louisiana's position in the case. Notably, you'll see in the opinion some reference to that, uh, that amicus and the suggestion that some of those states uh, at least indicated in their briefs that they would be interested in exploring potentially uh, whether they had the right to non-unanimous uh, juries in the future. Obviously, this case uh, was only dealing with Louisiana uh, and also uh, Oregon. Uh, although Oregon obviously was um, an amicus in in the case, um, the court in the decision grappled with some of the historical reasons for the requirements of non-unanimous uh, and unanimous juries, both uh, at the time prior to the founding, at the time of the founding, uh, back in English history that predated the founding, and. Uh, Justice Gorsuch certainly relied on that uh, history in part uh, to justify his reasoning in uh, overturning the Louisiana and Oregon rules and, and ensuring that uh, unanimous jury is part of the Sixth Amendment uh, right that is incorporated to the states. In particular, uh, Justice Gorsuch noted that there's strong evidence that Louisiana originally adopted its rule in 1898 during a constitutional convention, and that the speakers expressed views that uh, directly showed uh, that they intended to diminish uh, Black American influence on juries in Louisiana, and that this was part of uh, so-called Jim Crow uh, racial segregation efforts in the state at the time. Justice Gorsuch also pointed in his opinion to uh, the time of Oregon's uh, adoption of its requirements of non-unanimous juries. Oregon had a 10, 11 to 1 uh, requirement for, for uh, uh, jury verdicts in criminal cases. And he pointed to and what he claimed in his opinion, to have been a time in the 1930s of growing Klan, Ku Klux Klan influence in the state of Oregon, and that the efforts by the, in the state legislature to uh, allow for non-unanimous juries were a reflection of a an attempt to dilute the influence uh, of uh, minorities on juries. Um, the uh, the, obviously, the Sixth Amendment uh, simply states that the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state where the crime, wherein the crime shall have been committed. Uh, in the Apodaca versus Oregon decision in 1972, the Supreme Court held that a non-unanimous jury in a state criminal uh, court did not violate the Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury. But the decision was uh, even more fractured uh, than the present opinion in that it involved seven opinions, none of which commanded a majority of the court. The uh, lead opinion was drafted by Justice White and joined by the Chief Justice Berger, Justice Blackman, and Justice Rehnquist. 
Uh, there were then four dissenters, Stewart, Brennan, Douglas, and Marshall. Uh, and then Justice Powell joined uh, the uh, opinion drafted by Justice White, but did so based on his own reasoning. So what what get, got teed up then ultimately in the Ramos decision is what the impact was of Justice Powell's opinion, since presumably it was the most narrow, uh, could be construed as the most narrow basis uh, for the outcome in the Apodaca decision in 1972. Uh, funny enough, the court in the Ramos decision, none of the justices actually squarely answer that decision as to what is the most narrow ground for the, uh, the Apodaca decision and whether, in fact, it's correct that, uh, truly correct, that Justice Powell's uh, solo opinion is, in fact, the most uh, narrow ground, um, because the, it's certainly narrow, the most narrow in the sense that it had one justice on it, but is it most narrow in terms of its breadth, given that Justice Lewis Powell was, was uh, asserting uh, what he referred to as dual tracking corporation theory, which uh, held that when when cer certain Bill of Rights uh, amendments uh, that have apply the rule to the at the federal level don't necessarily have to apply exactly in the same way uh, at the state level. Um, the uh, uh, there's no doubt about it, however, that Justice Powell's um, solo opinion became. Uh, the basis for for his controlling vote. In the decision yesterday, uh, there are five. Uh, although the, it's a six to three vote, abrogating Apodaca and holding that the Sixth Amendment establishes a right to a unanimous jury in both federal and state courts. Uh, but there are five opinions. What's I think uh, probably most interesting for court watchers is that these five opinions did not break in what are often characterized as sort of the uh, traditional ideological fault lines that, that tend to be emphasized in media uh, coverage. Uh, there's an opinion by the court written by Justice Gorsuch, joined in full uh, by Breyer and Ginsburg, joined in part by Kavanaugh and Sotomayor. There's a concurrence by Sotomayor, a concurrence by Kavanaugh, a concurrence by Thomas, and then a dissent by Justice Alito, joined by the Chief Justice, and in part by uh, Justice Kagan. Um, so you can you can come up with a scorecard and break it down as to who who joins what. Um, but notably, uh, Justice Gorsuch's opinion is only joined in all respects by he. Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer. So that's an inter that's interesting company. Um, and of course, um, uh, but uh, as for the, the ruling on juror, juror unanimity, uh, there's you know six votes. Uh, Gorsuch, uh, writing for the court, uh, looks at the plain language of the Sixth Amendment's right to a trial by an impartial jury concludes that an impartial jury must have some substantive content and requirements, looks at uh, English history and uh, and the and and how and unanimity of trial juries at the time of the founding and concludes that that the sub that one of those substantive requirements that must have existed uh, in fact is unanimity. Uh, What's of course interesting is is that uh, is that again obviously is is a is a leap uh, of logic. Uh, we know that in the history, and this is dealt with in the opinion. We know in the history of the edip, of the adoption of the Sixth Amendment, uh, which was ratified ultimately in 1791, that uh, the original version adopted in the House. Uh, made uh, uh, express reference to the jury having to be unanimous. Um, 
that was taken out in the version that, that the Senate approved and that ultimately then was approved by both houses and then ratified by the states. There's therefore the, the back and forth debate as to whether it was taken out because it was unnecessary or it was taken out because substantively there was an intent to uh, allow the question of whether uh, a unanimous jury was required uh, to be decided um, uh, by the several states. Um, that decision presumably remains to be argued uh, uh, by by scholars and historians, um, but uh, obviously is done as a matter of the Supreme Court, at least um, uh, for now. As to the incorporation of the states, Justice Gorsuch wrote that there can be no question that the Sixth Amendment's unanimity requirement applies to state and federal criminal trials equally. Uh, there certainly was uh, one one would have thought that from the Supreme Court's decision in 1968 in Duncan versus Louisiana that had incorporated the Sixth Amendment uh, for other purposes unrelated to this unanimity requirement that the broad the breadth of the language in the Duncan versus Louisiana case would have led to that being the rule across the board for the Sixth Amendment. But obviously, the Apodaca decision in 1972 um, uh, certainly uh, changed that conclusion. All I can say is uh, the one thing I can, you know, one thing that constitutional scholars seem to all agree upon is that you don't really know what the Supreme Court means in a in any particular Supreme Court decision until there's a decision later that tells you what the Supreme Court uh, says it meant in its prior decision. In terms of stare decisis, which is the far more interesting decision uh, of aspects of this decision, uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, basically uh, is quite dismissive of, of the Apodaca decision um, uh, and asserts that those practices always stood on shaky ground, notwithstanding the court's 1972 decision uh, upholding it. Um, he reasons that because the de decision had been a 4-1-4 decision and because Justice Powell's controlling concurrence was based on this theory of dual-track incorporation, that even Justice Powell conceded it was foreclosed by uh, a relatively recent prior precedent, uh, you know, the Justice Gorsuch writes that it's difficult to see what the Apodaca decision uh, holding was and what rationale would have permitted the same result in future cases. Um, but obviously, the court had had decided uh, and had upheld the Louisiana rule uh, um, and, or the Oregon rule, and Louisiana and Oregon then continued to rely upon that rule after uh, that decision was handed down. I think one of the challenges for the state of Louisiana in arguing this case was that the Supreme Court uh, had not. Uh, definitively ruled on the propriety of non-unanimous juries, even in the Apodaca decision. And, and therefore, um, uh, it was hard to argue that the rule of unanimity, um, you know, was n not at any level constitutionally based such that, um, you know, uh, states could head down the road of having a, a 9-3 or a 7-5 rule. Um, and so there was, I think, uh, you had the slippery slope arguments that the Louisiana had to deal with in its position, as well as the fact that 48 states uh, had a contrary rule. Um, Gorsuch loads up his uh, opinion on various uh, prior decisions uh, in which the court had stated over 120 years he puts it 13 times over 120 years that the Sixth Amendment required unanimity in jury trials. Um, there's obviously a, probably a little bit of uh, uh, over over characterization there, given that the Apodaca decision uh, seemingly would not have held what it held if uh, those other cases had truly required unanimity in jury trials. That said, there was certainly uh, an, a large number of cases in which uh, it appeared that the Sixth Amendment was incorporated. Justice Gorsuch gets into then stare decisis in part 4A of the decision, 
which interestingly enough is joined by Justices Ginsburg and Breyer. And I'm not sure why, uh, because he does some things in that Justice Gorsuch says some things in that that one would think uh, uh, those justices might not have joined on, but they did. Um, first, he he states uh, that the court doesn't need to overrule Apodaca because it was not established precedent. Justice Alito, in dissent, uh, it really goes after uh, Justice Gorsuch's opinion uh, on this point um, and makes the point, well, if it's not precedent, what is it? It's a decision by the court. It was it upheld a rule at the time. The parties could rely upon it. But how is it? how does that not then make it precedent? You may disagree with it. You may think it's uh, poorly reasoned, but uh, it, it, it has to be precedent. Uh, and, and that obviously uh, uh, remains uh, an open question as, as to <laughs> if it's not precedent, what is it? And, and Justice Gorsuch replies that to accept it as precedential, the court would be determining that a single justice writing only for himself had the authority to bind this court to propositions it had already rejected. Um, I suppose, however, there's another way to look at it, which is that Apodaca is precedential. Um, it's just that the reasoning within it, um, it can't be accorded much weight because there's no majority opinion. Um, and that, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not, not pre precedent. It just means that presumably its value is lessened since there wasn't a, uh, a sufficient consensus to gain a majority on any one view in the case. In part 4B of Justice Gorsuch's opinion for the court, uh, in addition to Ginsburg and Breyer, Sotomayor and Kavanaugh join, uh, at least in uh, Kavanaugh and part joins. And in that portion of the opinion, Justice Gorsuch writes that even if Apodaca was controlling precedent, no one in the court is prepared to say it's rightly decided. And sorry, decides it isn't supposed to be the art, as he puts it, the art of methodically ignoring what everyone knows to be true, unquote. So, uh, Obviously, he's very dismissive of the reasoning in the Apodaca decision uh, and uh, relies on the other precedent. And then finally dis uh, takes care of and, um, and dismisses the reliance arguments that are raised by, were raised by the state of Louisiana and accorded much greater weight uh, by Justice Alito uh, in his dissent. Justice Gorsuch looks at the fact that obviously Oregon and Louisiana – uh, will have to start over on all, at least on all cases that are on direct appeal or at the trial level um, that uh, involve conduct that predates the passage, you know, that would be presumably uh, from 2018 or er uh, uh, earlier committed offenses. And he acknowledges that that would surely impose a cost, but notes that one, it's only in two states. Secondly, that the numbers involved uh, are likely to be potentially uh, fewer than some of the other uh, con criminal constitution decisions that have been made in recent memory. Uh, and he cites to United States uh, versus Booker, which uh, overturned, obviously, the binding nature of the U.S. sentencing guidelines and led to a lot of cases uh, in which uh, – defendants had to be resentenced. Uh, he then uh, notes um, as dicta, but presumably trying to argue the case in advance, that uh, uh, that this would be a new rule of criminal procedure, and therefore, uh, under the court's retroactivity jurisprudence, um, would, not normally would not normally apply in collateral review. Um, but obviously he acknowledges that the specific issue was not before the court. He concludes and dismisses this reliance argument by basically saying that even if the states needed to, quote, retry a slice of the prior criminal cases, it uh, cannot outweigh the interests we all share in the preservation of our constitutionally promised liberties, unquote. So he wraps himself uh, in, the, in the flag and uh, march, marches off. Justice Sotomayor writes a concurrence. Um, she, uh, you know, she 
certainly uh, joins in overruling the Apodaca decision, uh, and she reasons that it's fundamentally in conflict with two major lines of precedent, the Sixth Amendment's unanimity principle and the court's incorporation doctrine. She also makes the point in her concurrence that sorry decisis should be weakest in cases where fundamental constitutional rights bump up against criminal procedures and notes that this was uniquely true when the historical evidence indicated that Oregon and Louisiana's non-unanimous jury rules were rooted in racial animus and bias. Justice Kavanaugh also writes a concurrence. It's very lengthy. He lays out his views on prudential systematic principles that should govern when deciding whether to overrule constitutional precedents. Uh, he comes up with his own list uh, of, of uh, some considerations, uh, and uh, he notes that he, really it's a like we always seem to have. Uh, it's basically a three-part test. The court should over, only overrule constitutional precedent. It determines if it's not if it's not just wrong, but grievously or egregiously wrong. Uh, number two, the court should consider whether the incorrectly decided precedent, quote, caused significant jurisprudential or real world consequences, unquote. And three, the court should consider the extent of reliance on the prior constitutional decision. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh joins Justice Get, uh, Gorsuch in his opinion uh, because he concludes that the Apodaca decision was egregiously wrong and led to cases where defendants were convicted who might otherwise not have been, uh, which obviously would trigger, this, in his view, the significant jurisprudential or real-world consequences, and that the states would find it easy to apply the unanimity requirement and thus supported overruling Ramos. Justice Thomas, uh, in a short concurrence, agrees that the Constitution requires a unanimous jury verdict for state defendants uh, like Ramos, uh, he asserts, however, that the right applies to the states, uh, not through the Due Process Clause, but rather through the 14th Amen Amendment's Privilege and Immunities Clause. Uh, this has been uh, uh, a theory that he has been espousing for uh, many years and many decisions. Uh, he has not yet gotten other justices to join him on it, but he continues uh, to make the point. Uh, in decisions where he can. You know, at a quick note at the beginning, Justice Thomas expresses his view on stare decisis principles in constitutional cases. What he says is uh, that he applied the court's prior unanimity precedents because they fell within the realm of possible interpretation. But uh, what he is critical of is um, what he characterizes as the court's typical formulation of stare decisis because it does not comport with what he sees as the judicial duty under the Article Three of the Constitution to uh, simply interpret the Constitution based on the text and other duly in enacted federal law rather than rely on stare decisis to the contrary. Justice Alito in, in the dissent is joined by uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan, uh, Justice Kagan and all in one part. Alito uh, goes at uh, the majority opinion pretty strongly. He writes that whether or not the Apodaca decision was correctly decided, its decision uh, was, in fact, good, good law. It was precedential. That Oregon and Louisiana had tried thousands of cases in reliance on that. It was clearly precedent, whether there was clear reasoning to which the majority of the court agreed or not, the result, uh, that's State courts were not required to have unanimous juries was a controlling result, and the reliance by Oregon and Louisiana was massive and concrete, uh, and therefore, uh, since thousands and thousands of trials have been conducted in the 48 years since Apodaca, uh, it, it, there, and, there, and there would be a potential, as he put it, tsunami of litigation on jury unanimity, uh, unanimity issue. Um, what, what's interesting about Justice Alito's opinion, I think, also is uh, the, the way in which he and Justice Gorsuch go back and forth on the issue of precedent. Uh, 
uh, Justice Alito uh, basically uses a little bit is is a little snarky. Uh, uh, he he writes uh, um, uh, that quote I begin with the question whether Apodaca was a precedent at all. It is remarkable that it is even necessary to address this question. But in Part 4A of the principal opinion, three justices take the position that Apodaca was never a precedent. The only truly fitting response to this argument is, quote, really, unquote, um, consider what it would mean if Apodaca was never a precedent. It would mean that the entire legal profession was fooled for the past 48 years. Believing that Apodaca was a precedent, the courts of Louisiana and Oregon tried thousands of cases under rules allowing convictions by a, a vote of 11 to 1 or 10 to 2. And appellate courts in those states have held these convictions based on Apodaca. But according to three justices in the majority, these courts were deluded. So obviously, he didn't hold back. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, Justice Sotomayor certainly treats Apodaca as precedent, as does Justice Kavanaugh. So arguably, there are uh, five justices in this opinion who stand for the proposition uh, was that Apodaca is precedent of of, of some sort. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 